People are only afraid of the witch because they've been programmed to be. You can't cast a love spell on someone. Someone casts a love spell upon themselves. Playing in the realm of magic is not for the faint of heart. If you had a vendetta against a woman, you could just accuse her of witchcraft. It really just meant death. The feminine was erased from the nature of the divine. <laughs> Jesus was a full-blown witch. Can somebody do a curse on you or black magic on you? <laughs> Mia exactly. Magic, yeah. welcome. Thanks, babe. We've been on a whole journey together. We have indeed. Mm -hmm. When I first met you was really at kind of the start of this whole journey for me. Yeah. At Bhakti Yoga Shala. Yeah. I remember actually at Bulletproof Labs first and foremost was the first time we ever yeah. met and then connected through Bhakti Yoga. And I want to provide that context for everybody because mm. If those who are watching our regular Sky Life viewers, they probably have seen our episodes. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to share the context of how we actually met and the sisterhood that's been brewing and evolving over yeah. all of these years and yeah. the ways we've both transformed and evolved. And to witness that and to witness your growth and expansion <laughs> has been such a gift. And so mm -hmm. to arrive here and to be able to have a conversation like this that we have never had before yeah. publicly. Like we've done our episodes, but we've never actually gotten to sit down and dig deep and go into all these places together. Yeah. So I'm really excited. Explain the behind the scenes to everybody. Exactly, mm. <laughs> yeah. And what a better time to do it than our No season. better time, it's the full moon, come on. <laughs> exactly, <Yeah. laughs> exactly. So I first want to just start by you know, having you share from, you know, your understanding and your experience, can you please define the word witch for us? Oh, I think that like all words, we have personal definitions and we have collective agreed upon definitions, but the origin of the word itself means wise, one with wisdom, one who sees or knows. And so how I define being a witch means living in alignment with your wisdom. Knowledge is conceptual. Wisdom is embodied. It's the lessons that we've not only learned, but integrated into our ways of being and into how we function and behave that come from our experience of existence. So if we ignore our intuition or if we see patterns that are similar to our parents and the way that we relate to other people and we just keep doing the same thing over and over, we're not really learning anything. But if we change our habits every time we notice something new or experience a new epiphany or have a profound realization, then we're living in alignment with our wisdom. And for me, my wisdom has come from the earth, has come from nature and trees and rivers and mountains. And so my witchcraft and craft means strength or skill. So we're just strengthening the skill of our wisdom. And for me, it means knowing that I am one with the elements, the earth is my body, the water is my blood, the air is my breath, and the fire is the electricity that makes my heart beat. And when I create harmony with those elements within and without and relate to my reality as this beautiful holographic reflection, then I am able to be a more responsible steward of my dreams coming mm -hmm. true and also of the planet. So. I think that we all get to we all get to be witches. We all have our own unique magic as we've so discovered together and it's really about knowing that that magic is real and how you get to wield it. Mm. So much in there <laughs> that I want to touch on. So, first of all, I feel like that description of conscious awareness and making new decisions in our lives based on the conscious awareness we're bringing to how we see ourselves interacting with the world and reacting to things is the difference between being on autopilot and being yeah. asleep and then awakening to the reality that we are co-creating our lives and that by bringing that awareness to our lives, we can make new decisions and start to rewire how we operate in the world. And from my experience, that has been at least in my life my spiritual path yeah and seeing that happen in real time and then to see over years of that happening that you actually do transform as a human I think that's such a beautiful gift that even recently I've noticed such a huge shift happening from mm. putting that into practice yeah and so to relate that back to 
the witch to being a crafter of your deepest wisdom and intuition. That's why I've resonated so much with learning from you and learning about the craft. Um, I also think it's really ignited something within my soul and my inner child because yeah. I grew up in <laughs> Beverly next to yeah. Salem. Yeah. And it was such a big deal in elementary school learning about the witch trials in the area where I'm from. It, we spent a lot of time really learning about the history going to Salem and visiting all of these historic sites. And I absolutely loved going into the witch stores. And my <laughs> auntie brought me my first cloak when I was like eight years old. And I remember it, it was black with purple moons on it. And I loved my witch cloak. I would wear it to school. I've seen a picture of you in that cloak. <laughs> yes. And I just resonated with the witch so much as a little girl doing pendulums and Ouija boards with my friends. And then... I remember specifically like watching whether it's TV shows or yeah. movies and then my brother had a deep fear of witches because of the of you know the Wizard of Oz and yeah. all these films that we see that are portraying witches in a certain way and that actually really impacted my perception of the witch. I can look back on my experience of wait, where did I what where did I abandon that natural instinct and it was out of fear. So I would love for you to share a little bit more about the history of why the world is still afraid of witches, why they are portrayed in this evil type of demonic way in media. And it's been that way for so long. Where does that come? Where's the root of that? It's very common for the evil doer to have a scapegoat to blame someone else. And when you look at the amount of charges against the Catholic Church for child molestation and abuse, to me, that seems pretty evil. And yet they are, or the church has been the one proclaiming that women who were the healers of the villages were evil. They were bad. And witches were our healers. They were the ones who knew the plants and the plants were the medicine. They're not alternative medicine. Plants were our original medicine. So there's a lot of different timelines. And of course, without a time machine, and you know, this would be the exact time I would go back to if I had a time machine. But without a time machine, you can't really definitively say exactly what happened. But in the 300s, Rome was conquering everywhere. And there was an emperor named Constantine. And he was originally pagan himself. And he was like very sweet and welcoming to the Christians, which were a new religion. He shifted and changed. And he had begun to give a few little sacred sites to these people. Oh, let's give them places to worship. It's like, okay, this is another God. We can welcome them in with this God. But as the church, which had originally come from the ancient Jews, right? So some Jews shifted, started following Jesus, I think mistranslated and misrepresented pretty much all of his teachings and then became Christians, right? This is the 300 in the current era. So it's 300, two or 300 years after Jesus's supposed passing. And then eventually they started getting temples given to them. And then they would like confiscate the temple and they would turn it into a Christian temple. And whoever the deity had been that was worshiped there would be cast out. And then as we watch time go on, the church did begin confiscating riches and sacred sites all over the world. And within the five and six hundreds, the it was already the Roman Catholic Church. They were leading Rome. They were the governing body. And by 1500, which is like the Dark Ages, they were given absolute rule. So the church was basically the ruler of the world at that time. And the church started charging people to connect with God. Oh, you want to go to heaven? Pay your tithings. Oh, you want to get your grandpa who just died out of hell? Oh, so sorry. You're going to have to pay your tithings. And it's really a business. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a <laughs> untaxable business. The true evil on earth hid themselves behind some like cute little outfits and an illusion of piety and then made a scapegoat mm -hmm. the only people that like really didn't have a way of defending themselves. And oftentimes those village healers were elder women or women who lived alone or didn't have husbands. It's really about power. Yeah. And when we have sovereignty, it's like people who live off the grid and grow their own food. It's like they don't really need the matrix. They're good. They've got their cows. They've got their butter. They've got their solar electricity. They've got their root cellar. 
they're good. And so people were stripped of their sovereignty and their autonomy. And even the word propaganda comes from propagare, which was a department in the Roman Catholic Church charged with propagating the faith. So even the word propaganda Mm -hmm. originates in the church. And I think that's really, we've fallen under a, a, a mass illusion, but unfortunately the only way of fighting it or standing against it pretty much led to your death so it wasn't really an option to Mm. think for yourself one thing I really appreciate about you is how knowledgeable you are about the history of this path of the witch of of how we got to where we are today and you're like an encyclopedia for this I learned so much when I talked to you about it and it's so interesting having grown up again learning about the Salem witch trials and then understanding that oh that's because when the pilgrims came to to Massachusetts in 1621 they were bringing all of that experience from the European witch trials of the 13 to 15 1600s with them into this new world they were building and then that seeped into to their society and in 1692 when the witch trials happened in Salem it was about land ownership and power yeah and a lot of Salem historians that have deeply studied the witch trials they will tell you it wasn't actually about witchcraft it was about power which is ultimately what this really is all about and you know that was very late 1692 is very late you know the wit the witch's hammer that maleficus maleficarum one of the second I think second book ever put in print like the first book book it put in print was the bible and the second book was the witch's hammer about Mm -hmm. torturing and killing witches and that was long before so 1692 is late yeah and there was i believe i believe 19 people that were hung and Mm -hmm. one man who was stoned to death in salem but in we have to remember that in the european witch trials that happened the the centuries prior it was thousands millions nine million women is the current accurate estimate Wow. And I know not all of the victims were women, but I Mm-mm. I know the statistic that I I'm fact check me on this. It was like 80% <laughs> yeah. or more yeah. were women. Mm-hmm. So it was really this genocide that happened of wise women, the witches of the time. Oh, for Magical, sure. Powerful women. Oh, for sure. And how there's such a fear. Yeah. Um so I really want to get into that like why are we still fearing um, the witch? Even though now it's so cool to see that it's almost become trendy that the witch is so in right now. <laughs> I mean, there's so much content about it. Yeah. You have all these celebrities now that are even embracing yeah. this and you have song lyrics, whether it's Beyonce or Ariana Grande that are singing about magic and their powers and like that's dope i love that it's now yeah i think the tide has turned for sure um however you know i still feel there's this fear of witchcraft people you know doing black magic on you or putting a spell on you or cursing you and i'm really curious to hear your thoughts on that and really i want to talk about the laws of magic and how that actually works and functions like can somebody do a curse on you or black magic on you based on the universal laws of how this stuff works people are only afraid of the witch because they've been programmed to be you know can someone put a curse on you you know There are people who would say yes, and they hear my opinion on it. They're like, what are you talking about? Of course someone can put black magic on you. From my perspective, no one can put black magic on you because the universal law of oneness states that all things are one. If all things are one and I try to put black magic on you, but I am you, then I'm just putting black magic on myself. And if you're afraid that I'm putting black magic on you, but you're me, then really you're just putting black magic on yourself. If I tell myself like, okay, I'm gonna not eat any glutinous bread. I'm gonna like be really strict on my non-gluten thing. But then I eat a piece of sourdough toast this morning like I did, I'm breaking a promise to myself. And anytime we break a promise to ourselves, even if it's something small, we're communicating to that inner child, to that little being inside of us, oh, your needs or your desires or that thing that you asked me for, that thing that I promised you that I'll give you, I'm not going to do that. And we do this every day when we stay in jobs that we hate or when we, you know, proclaim that we're going to stay single and we're going to work on ourselves and then we get really quickly into new relationships and distract ourselves from doing that work and then just keep into our old patterns. And that little wounded part of us says, but 
what about me? And we neglect or suppress or shut down or shove aside that little version of ourselves. And that is us doing black magic on ourselves. That is us Mm -hmm. breaking promises and refusing to be in alignment and in integrity with our truth or with our commitments, with our devotion to self. If you and God and I are all one, then it's like, who are you lying to? Mm. You're lying to God when you lie to yourself. Mm. If you are God and you're lying to yourself and you're lying to God, then you're going to feel mistrusting. You're going to have doubt. You're going to feel afraid. And so that is how I respond to people reaching out to me asking about black magic. It's like, well, where are you participating in the perpetuation of black magic in your own life and you know some people are like oh but so and so can put a picture and like (laughs) wrap a ribbon or like I bind you Nancy you know from the craft (laughs) like okay maybe but even that person that you would bind is just a reflection of a shadow inside of you I'm not here to teach people how to do spells I'm a like don't give a man a fish and feed him for a night Like teach him to fish and feed him for life. Because if you can look at everything in your reality like this, if you can face off with all of your fear and anything that you would project outside of yourself as like bad or scary or wrong or evil, that is what offers you ultimate freedom. And because you are the only one who you can control in your life, it really gives you back the reins of power in how you function and, and move through the world. I grapple with this thing around taking full ownership and responsibility of my life and experience because I ultimately fully resonate and believe in that path. I feel it's most empowering for me when I can say anything that is coming up in my life is something that I'm creating for my highest evolution. Mm -hmm. And that's to me a much more empowering way to live rather than the victim mindset of everything is happening to me. And I also question myself in that belief of, am I spiritual bypassing if I have that belief? Or is there an instance where, you know, there is genuine victimhood that occurs? Or am I not being like compassionate to myself or others for when like life just happens? And I, so I almost am still navigating how I relate to that sentiment right however I've witnessed in my own life like when I take responsibility for everything that's happening and I take the reins and I say okay this is showing up for me to see something or to be able to evolve in some way Mm. it always like massively transforms me and so I just have found when I did approach life from more of a life's happening to me it, it, it just wasn't as um, it wasn't as good as it is now, kinda right? Kind of sucks. Kind of feel like the sucked, victim, right? Right? Yeah. Like life kind of sucked, and now life yeah. kind of is like, wow. I look at my, my my last several years of this path, and I can see how that mindset and way of approaching the world has massively transformed me as a human and made me a better person like for not just myself but like the people in my life and I even had a situation recently where I just got you know with with family that's you know the Ram Dass quote like if you think you're enlightened go spend a week with your family I had just like a major trigger happen with one of my family members and to the point where I was like I didn't know I could get triggered like that anymore Mm -hmm. and then it just showed me oh yes I you you can you're still very much uh, a humble human and rather than say oh this like they're doing this to me yeah and I really used the opportunity to say what why is this coming up yeah what is this here to show me and through that sitting with that and being in the mirror of it I had the biggest breakthrough like it was miraculous and yeah. since that I've I've had such a major shift happen in a part of my life I was struggling with for many years mm. and so I'm curious how do you start to um, work with your life on this level and how do you start to actually like practically make these shifts because sometimes it can feel like oh, okay I want to be empowered. I want to take responsibility of my reality. I want to co-create my dreams. I want to manifest what I want. But how do I do that? You know, where do you 
recommend people start to really empower themselves through the crafting of their wisdom in this way of seeing reality as a mirror? I would start with the thing that maybe isn't like the deepest trigger, right? If you have deep childhood trauma and like abuse with your family, maybe don't like, oh, I'm going to immediately heal all of my daddy issues and my wounds. Like start small. So look at something in your life that you don't like your job or even just your belief about what work is, your belief about success, your belief about money, anything that kind of annoys you, right? It's not like a thing that puts you back into a trauma response, but it's something that annoys you. You're like, I'm going to get rid of this thing. I don't like this. And look at the things that you point outwards, right? You're like, oh, well, you know, my dad did this or like this person hurt me or they did something like this. And remember every time you're pointing outwards, you got three fingers pointing back at yourself. Like, (laughs) oh, this has something to do with me. Which is like such a cliche term, but it's so true. I mean. Like it always is true. It's always true. Right? So we all are manifesting these different and unique experiences all the time. But the best way is to start looking at, okay, something very small. How does that thing that I don't like outside of me reflect inside of me? And even going back to the black magic, it's like if I make myself a promise, if I proclaim something, if I say I'm going to do something and then I don't do it, that is me breaking that strong, empowered masculine energy. That's me being in wounded masculine energy. I'm not moving forward in this positive, motivated, directive energy and path like the masculine would. And so you get to look at anything and everything in your experience and in your reality. And again, you start small. Start with small things. Start with something that a friend says to you that triggers you. Start with like the way that your roommates don't clean up the dishes or whatever. And then look at, okay, where did I not tell them what I needed? Where did I allow my boundaries to be crossed? Where did I pretend like it was okay and just say like, oh yeah, no, no, it's fine. No problem. I'll do it. And then I've established, I've established a precedent that is even when I'm upset or even when I feel unsupported, I'm going to still punish myself or make myself unworthy of being cared for and I'm going to go and clean the dishes or I'm going to go, you know, ignore a red flag and keep dating this person. And it's it's in the small things. It's in every choice you make can put you onto a different timeline. You can choose to go down or up with every single choice and they are, that's what's so interesting about this holographic reality is it can be as small as what you're eating what you're wearing, who you're dating. It's, they're small things and it's daily. It's every single day. So if you can watch yourself, you know, tell someone, oh yeah, I'm I'm on my way, but you're not, you're still in your pajamas. That's a lie. You're lying to that person and you're showing yourself by sending that lie. It's not like it's going to hurt anybody, right? But by sending that lie out, you're communicating to your body, it's not safe to be in my truth. Mm Mm-hmm. It's not safe to be right here where I am in my pajamas instead of saying, hey, my love, I'm so sorry. I'm running behind. You know, I I wasn't feeling well or like I'm just moving slow today or anything that's true. And so if you can start getting yourself into just a deeper truth with who you are and acknowledging the shadows that play a role in every single aspect of your life where you're the common denominator – Again, like, what have you received from your dad? What have you inherited from your family lineage, whether it's poverty or infidelity or obesity, whatever it is, what am I believing that they believed and what what is the nature of that belief and how can I go in and work with my inner child? And obviously this gets like more complex. How can I have a therapist or a somatic coach or facilitator that's going to help me work through things, which we've done so many beautiful times together, but finding support or just being devoted on your own. Like I did so much of this work on my own before I could afford help. And I was with a sister this morning and I was so impressed with her. Her mom died recently and she got up and she just sat, she lit a candle and poured a 
cup of tea and she just sat and sobbed and wept. And when she finished, I went up to her and I was like, hey, baby girl, you doing okay? You need anything? And she was like, no, I think I just need to keep feeling it. And I was like, good, I'm so proud of you. And she's like, yeah, because I got up and I was just like, oh, should I just like get a workout in and just like move this energy? Or should I just like, you know, curl up in bed and watch a show and just ignore it and deflect it? And she didn't do either of those things. She just sat in it and just felt it and just gave it space. Mm-hmm. And communicating that to your body, mm-hmm. even this shame, even this pain, even this scarcity, even this unworthiness, I'm willing to sit with you. I'm willing to listen mm-hmm. to you and hear what it is that you need from me. Mm-hmm. That is a quantum leap mm-hmm. in and of itself. That changes your relationship to your emotions and that lessens the groove of distraction and numbing and avoidance and lifts you up into a truer field of awareness. And again, it's mm-hmm. it's hard to do, but hard choices, easy life, and easy choices, oh, hard life. I love that quote and I feel that that is, that is where the deepest transformation happens is when we can be present with what we are feeling and how it feels in our body. And sometimes, you know, with the videos that I share on my channel, whether it's the work that we've done together and documenting that and publicly sharing that, or it's work with other healers or teachers or guides that are taking me through some type of somatic experience if you have not experienced that type of work it can be very confusing uh it can be kind of crazy to look at and say what what is going on but really from my experience the what it comes down to is actually just giving space to bring awareness to what is coming up in your body and to allow the energy to move in the way that it wants to move without judgment and without an attachment to what that looks like in a safe container. And so a lot of the work that we've done together through these many videos we've documented, that is really what you're seeing, is you guiding me into an experience, into a different state, yeah. you know, out of the normal analytical mind mm-hmm. and into the body, into a more hypnotic theta brainwave Mm -hmm. state where you can access the subconscious which is actually what is running our lives and dictating how we make decisions on a day-to-day basis most of it's coming from subconscious wiring so we're going into that place and then excavating and 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 bringing out whatever's Mm -hmm. there yeah and I've and alchemizing it actually like in real time alchemizing and I've seen such deep transformation from these experiences and many I have not documented I started doing polarity therapy when I was in college Mm. and I was going through severe depression anxiety just just really lost had no type of faith or belief system and this was before I ever started my YouTube channel I went to a therapist a psychotherapist who used energy healing and polarity therapy in her work and when I experienced it for the first time I never I never felt anything like it Mm. and it supported me so deeply and so then to go on this journey of then starting to document it and then not knowing half the time it's actually what's going to (laughs) happen like I don't actually go into these videos just like planning that like I just go in open-minded and with the, the intention to fully immerse myself in the experience and that's just what happens and so it's really brave it's really courageous and you know that that's just something that I celebrate about you so much because it's really bold to share those things especially what has been deemed exorcisms and demonic for hundreds of years it's incredibly incredibly brave to say oh I'm gonna try it and I'm gonna film it and I'm gonna show it to the world (laughs) Just to help everyone feel safe in it. It's a really big, important thing you've been doing. Thank you. And it's not something that I feel I, again, planned. It just started happening. And I felt this thing within me every time when I felt terrified to press publish. I Mm. felt the inner Mm. thing being like, you have to share this. You have to share this. And feeling this questioning of, is anybody going to get it? And then every time I'm absolutely blown away by the, you know, hundreds thousands of comments that come in around how much it resonates or how deeply emotionally um you know 
charged watching the video was for someone yeah. because they can ex they can resonate with that own experience in their own life and you know of course there's like plenty of people that misunderstand it entirely and judge it and like have all sorts of things to say but like I don't I care about those that yeah. when they watch that it shifts something within them and that's why I keep doing it but now the evolution has been you know I've done a lot of that work for um I guess it's been over 10 years now, yeah. right? So now to feel like I'm going into a new evolution of the channel of actually like all the lessons of the past decade getting to actually talk about them in depth with people is really fun and exciting for me. And so I would love to talk to you more about, you know, the work that we've done together and around some of the specific videos, whether it's the love spell video, I want to get into that because that was like, just there's so much that came from that video yeah. in my evolution and your evolution yeah. um, i know people are really interested in how to manifest whether it's love or more abundance or the life of their dreams and i want to offer um, those listening like just empowerment around how to create what they want um, but i do want to dive into the love spell because i think when people hear love spell like they would maybe think off the top of their head that it means you're putting a spell on someone. Yeah. And I think we both know that's not true. <laughs> the thing about love spells, there's been a lot of conversation, you know, about our video since then. And it's just so funny to me that people think that like you can cast a love spell on someone. You can't cast a love spell on someone. Someone casts a love spell upon themselves. You choose to be enamored by love. You choose to cross over your own boundaries or to keep your armor up or to give yourself all the way to love. And that's what I thought was so beautiful about that ritual and, and that day, you know, turns into whatever it was, a 20 minute video, right? We spent eight hours together that day. It was a long, beautiful day of many practices. The ritual is about falling in love with yourself. And when we fall in love with ourselves, we are magnetic to more love. When I went to see you for the love spell, for me, it was more of like a fun, oh, it's Valentine's I'd say I want to just like play yeah. around with this like yeah. I'm single I'm I'm open to ready to mingle open to intimacy in my life and for me that video and the work we did together it had nothing to do with I want to put a spell on someone or even I want to attract a partner yeah. it was all about the relationship to myself yeah. and where I was making myself wrong or bad or I was feeling guilt around receiving pleasure. And I am not kidding you, Mia, before that day and bringing awareness to mm. that, every time that I would have any intimacy, it was guilt after. Yeah. That shifted. Yeah. And I did not after that ever feel that guilt happened again, which is crazy to have like the shift come in that. That's the love right? spell. Like, no, that's the love spell. With the love spell, you know, I met my partner my ex-partner we're yeah. not together anymore it was three years of beautiful relationship that was exactly what it needed to be for that time yeah. and so i think that's also important to mention is like okay the love spell worked i meet totally. logan like two weeks later in the most synchronistic way mm -hmm. we spent three years together of just the most supportive yeah. partnership and then it was time for us to move on. Yeah. And that that's also okay. Like, you know, totally. we're not trying to, in that instance, I wasn't like, I'm manifesting my husband, yeah. you know, but a to relationship have, ending doesn't mean a relationship failed. Um, I think that's 100%. a huge misconception. That was one of the most like successful relationships of my life. Mm. And it ended actually in such a harmonious, respectful, loving way. And I'm so grateful for him and the time we spend together. And it evol I evolved so much through yeah. it. And I feel that that self-love that started with the love spell just like got amplified with our partnership because of the way he held sacred safe space for my feminine yeah. and for my pleasure to come alive. And I think for women, that's such a huge topic of just the levels of shame that we have been programmed to feel around yeah. pleasure. Yeah. All part of the witch wound, all yeah. systematic, all intentional. <laughs> this is a topic you talk a lot about. So I'm, I'm curious if you can share and define what is the witch wound. The witch wound is the pain that we experience when we 
try to live in alignment with our wisdom. So whether that's awareness of wanting to tend to the earth better, but all the food comes in plastic or wanting to share our voice and our path and our practice online, but that fear of pressing publish every time or that worry of what people are going to think or we feel, you know, so many times in my classes and programs, you know, we had such a big, beautiful coven of your community that came in and all did witch school together. And really what birthed my business beyond just witch school and the courses was seeing that people didn't just need to learn how to do the rituals, right? Like, yeah, you can learn how to do the rituals, but if you believe that what you're doing is inherently evil and bad and you received all this programming and the fear of witches like so many people have and you're fearing yourself and you're like doing something that feels so natural, but then you just hear that voice, that inner witch hunter, that's what I call it. That's like the inner Voldemort. You hear that voice saying, oh, you're going to be struck down or like God's going to smite you. That is the witch wound. It's the programming and the fear that exists from living in our wisdom. So the witch wound plays a role in all of the different aspects of our wisdom. It can be in our sexuality, in our pleasure. It can be in our creativity, in what we're offering, in in how we're showing up in business. So we all, we get so afraid of, of our power because it was dangerous. And if you stood up for someone else, if you tried to defend another's power or the, the witch in your village, it really just meant death. Mm-hmm. You were suppressed. There was no... There was no other option than than subservience and falling in line. And so the witch wound really, it plagues us all. And that's the part where, you know, the men who were left behind by all those women are also impacted. Mm-hmm. No one no one got away mm-hmm. without being touched by it, at least a little. In the work that you've done with me and all of your your clients, like what is the theme around around what's blocking people from manifesting love in their life? The theme around what's blocking people is going to be different for everybody, but it's beliefs. So what did your parents or the relationships in your childhood teach you about love and or the gender of partner that you're looking for? Did you learn that men could be trusted or that men were pigs? Do you perpetuate those beliefs? Every time that I'm manifesting partnership, when I was manifesting my partner who was in all of our videos... I was working on my own inner masculine. Now I'm manifesting a king. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with my kingly energy. So I notice when I take a bite of sourdough that has gluten in it because I told myself I wasn't going to do that, I'm watching every one of those decisions because that's how you do it. It's that particular. It's not about anybody else. It's not about anyone else. It's about you. And do I, when I make those choices, do I feel shame? Do I feel guilt? Do I feel bad? Or like last night, it wasn't even about the the toast, but last night I had some baklava, also has gluten in it, but I made a choice. I was like, I'm going to eat this with the most pleasure and enjoyment and celebration of my sister who loves baklava and I am going to feel I could feel the olive groves of the Mediterranean and the and the pistachios warming in the sun that doesn't make me feel bad about myself that makes me feel the the directed positive empowered masculine and that fertile sexual sensual energy of the feminine that's divine union within but if I betray myself and I go against what I'm going to say and I, you know, like, oh, guiltily take my little bite of sourdough, like I'm not stepping into the kind of masculine energy that's trustable for a queen mm. that's like worthy of that kingly energy. I wouldn't want my man to be like, <laughs> like hiding little things behind my back, Mm. right? I would want him to be in integrity and forthcoming and true and stand in his like, yeah, I'm eating sourdough, you know? It's subtle, but it's like, this is it. Well, I love the sourdough (laughs) example and analogy because you know I love sourdough sourdough. and I'm a gluten girly. Like you will never catch me gluten free. Um, I don't feel no guilt around sourdough. Give me that. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) Whatever it is for you, whatever that thing is for you where you have set a boundary in your life for your highest good and then you violate that and the energy around the violation is guilt and shame. Yep. 
I feel like it's such a balance around like how we relate to our inner masculine structure and discipline yeah. and the feminine flow and care and nurturing. Yeah. Um, and inner yeah. authority, right? Yes. So like even if you look at all four of the elements, earth and water are the feminine elements, air and fire are the masculine elements. Air and fire is the element of the mind and the element of action and, and movement. So it's like how we think and how we believe and how we take action. And then earth and water are how we feel our emotions and how we create, how we are existing in abundance, what we touch, what we feel, all of our senses. But I know you as well went through, you know, a separation and uncoupling, you know, in the is around the same, the same time, time. Yeah. which is actually so interesting Just after five years instead of three. Oh my god it's the best part about that relationship was how much i learned from it ending actually it turns out that a lot of what i had created funny how that works out is or was a direct reflection of my beliefs about myself my beliefs about men my beliefs that i've inherited from my father and i could not have had a more clear roadmap for the next layers of my evolution and the next invitations and opportunities for my growth without us breaking up. Mm -hmm. And it was just, yeah, it just had reached its expiration date. It was ready to be done. I can feel the way that I sacrificed my needs. And those are such important pieces. If you just stay with the same person and keep like operating in your patterns over and over and over again and letting those same patterns that have informed your entire reality continue informing your reality day after day for decades, it's like, well, what else do I do? You don't know what else is possible. And for me, the completion of that relationship just showed me so much of my own beliefs and where I was settling, where I was allowing myself to receive crumbs of love. And now I'm like, I want the whole bakery. Mm. And I get to give that to myself. And that is something so beautiful. And, you know, I... I bless him and I love him and I just like send so much sweetness to him because we had so much fun together in so many moments. They're all here to teach us. Where am I avoiding doing the work? Where am I refusing to look at a shadow? I want to be my own king. I want to be so, so dependable to myself. I want to be so trustable to myself, so direct on exactly where I'm going and what I'm doing, even just within who I am, doesn't have anything to do with my business, that there's nothing else mm -hmm. except that kind of energy that will enter into my life. Because I don't want to just like date someone casually. I want to start a family yes. and create a legacy with somebody. I can feel the power of that person so much because I'm becoming them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. And that's the love spell is that's it. you become – you know what you need yeah. in partnership and then that magnetizes to you yeah in sometimes the most magical synchronistic beautiful ways totally um, yeah so interesting i'm not gonna get into my i know love love we're story. just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah mm -hmm. not not now it's been so illuminating and so healing to just be in my own energy again for the first time in five mm -hmm. years and mm -hmm. since all of this beautiful magic and and you know the all these exorcisms like you and i made a rage ritual video and it didn't hit the way that like the rage rituals have gone insanely viral billions of views mm -hmm. like it's mm -hmm. it's wild. And I had my own rage ritual that yeah. was hitting, yeah. you know, the 50 million views. Exactly, yeah. It was Yeah, the screaming on the of, volcano. Exactly. exactly. But it's Same all idea. just like people expressing themselves exactly. and having emotions together. <laughs> Novel. <laughs> but those things in the collective are making a big wave and a big scene because we are shifting the dynamics. Yes of like if the witch is coming back that means that the collective feminine energy is rising it is returning there's a shift occurring and i love that you even said the fact that it's trending the fact that we can talk about it means that change has occurred the tides are turning and so as we're watching ourselves awaken to that integration and that divine union we watch 
the divine masculine and the divine feminine unite in the world too. And I, I think that there's so much hope. And so that's why, you know, people like us get to look at these things and say, okay, I'm going to feel my rage. I'm going to feel my sadness. I'm going to feel my pain. Going back to the very beginning in this history of witchcraft, the feminine was erased from the nature of the divine. The father, the son, and the Holy Spirit, it was originally the mother, the maiden, or the maiden, the mother, and the matron, the maiden, mother, and crone. The original trinity is life, death, and rebirth. It's impossible for there to be a trinity without the feminine. Mm -hmm. The trinity for real is the mother, the father, and the child, not the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. That doesn't make any sense. It's so interesting because <laughs> I have a friend that's really Christian, and I enjoy having conversations with people of different belief systems. I just am curious. You know, I want to know why someone believes what they believe. And I had a friend that was ta talking to me about the Bible and and, uh, and then they're talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity. And, and I asked, like, well, why is it? masculine i'm just curious and they're like well that's just what it says yeah exactly and i'm like well what do you mean that's what it says like what did it say before that's what it says and their answer was like but that's just what it says in the bible yeah taking that as like the ultimate truth yeah this is what we received from god and this is just this just is the message and what was before was the mother but not without the father it was both it's the mother earth who grows the plants and the food and the flowers and the trees who makes the seeds. And then it's father sky and the sun who shines down upon us, even with Jesus, the, the light of the world. He's the sun. No, the sun, S-U-N, is the light of the world. All of the Bible. I mean, there's a lot. It's, it goes deep. But like all of the Bible was originally based on allegory of nature. It's metaphors of nature. That's why Jesus' birthday is around the winter solstice because that's when the light returns, mm -hmm. the light of the world. The sun is born again. And earth resurrects in spring, around spring equinox, a.k.a. Easter, named for the goddess Ostara, who is the Celtic queen of fertility. It's all about nature. It's mm -hmm. all about life itself. And the feminine has been eradicated and erased from that. And that's the problem with religion is they don't, or it's not the problem with religion. It's, and it's not the problem with Jesus. Jesus, we love. Jesus was a witch. <laughs> Jesus was a full blown witch. He's like casting miracles and like washing people's feet and being so compassionate and like love your neighbor and the kingdom of heaven is within me. Like Jesus is a witch. The people who speak on his behalf, mm -hmm. not so much and not actually teaching his true teachings of love and charity. But when you look at all of those stories, they're telling us stories about nature, even how we got the devil. Originally, it was the mother and the father, right? They are the counterpart. It's the earth and the sky. We need them both. It takes two to tango. When dogmatic monotheistic religion took over, they erased the mother. And so in the mother's place, they put the father. And then in the father's place, the spiritual counterpart to the mother, they're like, okay, who goes here? Well, the father used to be, what does the father in all of the animals that have helped us survive look like? He's a horned and hooved being. Deer, elk, bison, cows, goats, sheep. The masculine has horns. And a lot of those horns, even when you look at those animals, those horns are the shape of the womb. That skull, and those little horns or antlers, that's what our uterus and our ovaries look like. And what the shape of the hat looks like. And the like. hat. You flip the hat upside down, there it is. It's the shape of the womb. Mm-hmm. It's not an accident. Mm -hmm. But that figure who has, was referred to as the horned god or the green man or father nature or father sky or just the god where she's the goddess that's who became the devil. So mother is erased, father put in her place. Now they're pitted against one another. They're fighting against one another. This is a battle between good and evil instead of, no, both sides have shadow and light. Both sides are yin and yang. Both sides carry pieces of one another within and it requires both sides to create the child, to create life for that third entity to arise. And so that's really my only problem with religion is that I think that we're all suffering from a deep spiritual disease 
of separation and disconnection Mm -hmm. from the mother and from nature and from our planet and from our own feminine sides because the feminine is our emotions and our creativity and our sexuality. And you look at all of these things and they're all associated with water and look what we do to the water. We shit in it. We poison it. We dam it up. We pollute and toxify it. We it's there's plastic in it everywhere. It's dirty. Like how many rivers and creeks and streams left in the world can you just bend down and drink from? Not that many. That used to be our own that was our source of water. And even all the water that comes from your tap, that's still the source of it. But they're just draining it all and then poisoning it and putting chemicals in it. You're communicating to the water. There's something wrong with you. You're broken. You need to be fixed. You need to be stripped of everything that you have. You need to be siphoned over here. And like, we're going to waste you. Mm-hmm. We're going to just let you run dry. We're going to put you into plastic and contain you. And that's what we do to our emotions and our sexuality. I just got full chills. Mm-hmm. And our creativity. We tell people they shouldn't be artists. But we need artists. We need artists mm-hmm. so badly. This world would be so devoid of beauty without artists. And entertainment, music, mm-hmm. everything. Those are artists. And then people are like, oh, don't follow your art. That's a horrible idea. Go get a regular job. Mm-hmm. Be a good little uh, obsequious, you know, subservient little employee. And so we all feel these dams inside. And I've been thinking really deeply, like I'm from Northern California and and there are these, the world's largest dam removal project is occurring in the, in the Klamath River. And for the first time in hundreds of years, these salmon that have not been seen at the top of the river and in these creeks where they come from, they're already repopulating. And that is such a beautiful representation of what's possible if we take these dams out, if we remove these blocks from our sexuality and our creativity and our emotions, life will return. We can regenerate. We can reawaken our true nature and our and our power and our oneness with nature. And that will bring back not just our physical and and inherent abundance the way that the natural world grows and plants are like so beautiful these are fake plants but you know (laughs) you know what I mean it's like you get the idea (laughs) but we will also then receive that spiritual abundance again Mm. because if the mother is the representation of it and we've removed her from the nature of the divine how are we ever going to feel truly abundant Mm -hmm. that was one of the biggest unlocks for me in understanding the witch and the path of the witch and this ancient lineage yeah was when i understood that it really was about connecting with the great mother Mm. and all along it was just connecting back with her and with nature and the elements and honoring the elements and when I understood that and when that landed in my body I was like oh I think I'm a witch (laughs) you were a witch from day one girl it Uh was easy she was was like I remember I I was like yeah no actually to to just go back to that moment in your house in the first video we did together when me you and Hana were breathing I had this almost this lightning bolt of remembrance of women have been doing this for thousands of years and my ancestors would once do this and why have I not been doing this my whole life why is this so novel for me to be sitting here with sisters and breathing and then feeling this surge of energy and then oh my gosh I remember that this is what I need to be doing that moment changed my life it it had that full body activation of remembering mm. and anchoring in the witch lineage into my body again and just remembering mm. you know it was never gone it's just something that i had shut down yeah and so i thank you for that moment and <laughs> you know everything that's unfolded since because you have been such a powerful teacher and mentor to me you know it hasn't always been easy I think that's the beautiful thing about yeah learning and growth it's not meant to be easy it's meant to show you your shadows it's meant to call you forward it's meant to you know push you to the next stage of your evolution and like you've been that person for me in this specific path of of really owning my own wisdom and claiming it yeah, yeah, you've done such a great job. And it is, I think that that's, again, just to keep this thread that we've been tugging at this whole time is like, 
it is going to bring stuff up, but that's the point. If you want to grow and you want to evolve, if you want to be able to hold more power and wield more magic and make more of your dreams come true and receive more abundance, you're going to have to keep expanding your comfort zone. You're going to have to keep meeting those edges. If you if you hit an edge, right? Like I consider myself a pretty edgeless person. It's like hard for me to hit the edges of my comfort zone because it's really big. But if you want to hit those edges, you're going to have to get uncomfortable. And if you want to expand and keep growing and keep going, then every time you hit an edge and a moment of discomfort, you get to choose how you want to respond to it. And if you want to like curl back in and be like, nah, I don't want to do that, you can, but the magic lies on the other side and lies in the other choice. Again, that that, that hard choice that makes life easier. I would love for you to just leave everyone watching. Like, what do you want to leave everyone with? They can they can anchor into their being and, and every cell of their being. What do you want to, to share to close out? Your magic is so real. All the fairy tales and all the fantasies, all the lore and legends you've ever heard are possible for you to bring to life in your existence. You are the hero or heroine of your story. We are meant to live legendary lives and we can turn our fantasies into reality. And we are so capable of healing and it is hard. It's the hardest choice you will ever make, but it's the most worth it. And this world depends on us. Look at the sacred ground beneath your feet, no matter where you live, no matter how high up in a skyscraper, the earth is there beneath you somewhere. Go back to her, connect with her, listen to her, ask her questions, sit beneath a tree. Indigenous peoples call plants our older brothers and sisters because they have been here for millions of years longer than us. Go and remember how to listen to them. Remember that your body is a reflection of this earth. The blood in your veins is the rivers and creeks and streams. The breath in your lungs is given to you by the trees and vice versa. We exchange it in this divinely designed perfect way and there is fire in your beating heart. You are nature. You are a reflection and an emanation of nature. You are a child of the great mother. You are brothers and sisters with every other person on this planet. And if we remember to work together with the true powers that we are so capable of accessing and look anything that we point at and blame and shame outside of us in the mirror, including war and the way that we starve ourselves or the way that we abuse our inner children, if we can have compassion and we can keep our promises to ourselves and make new promises to this planet, we can change the world. I believe it wholeheartedly. I'm here to fly on a dragon in this lifetime and we can all make our dreams come true. We just have to undam the rivers and remove the blocks that are in the way of the flow of life moving through us and using us as its sacred vessel mm. so my prayer is for our uh. healing and awakening mm. <laughs> so it is, so it is. <laughs> wow i just <laughs> anchored that into my body <laughs> thank you so much Mia. yes babe i love, I love you, you. <laughs> you're so cute yeah 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 and we so still much. have all the sky life you all you sky life people you can still use you can use your oh, code. Oh, yeah, let's throw on, it, throw yeah, it in On there. all the programs, let's anything, go. everything you want, coaching, you want healing, you want love spells, you want money, magic, and abundance rituals, you want deep embodiment and healing work, anything and everything on miamagic.com. Boom. Use your code SKY. Yeah, Get don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Easy little corner.